Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your diary to be with us here today. So today we're going to be covering our user behavior and whiskey tasting boot camp. Uh, we've got quite a lot to cover, but before we get going, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. We will be fielding some questions at the end of the session. So if you do have questions during the webinar, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box so that should be on your screens now. We'll also be recording the session as well. So if you want to take screenshots, don't worry about it. We'll be sending this out to you within a couple of days. Finally, if there is anybody that you think would benefit from this, please feel free to share the item. Or if you want to see an actual demonstration or a personalized demonstration of anything that we covered today, reach out and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Perfect, thank you, Stephen. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, we are Aim Security. Uh, we were founded in 2016, um, and, and our um, our strategy, our goal, our mission is to create a better, smarter, and simpler way to deliver cybersecurity. We actually have two parts of our portfolio, but for the sake of today, uh, we'll focus on our Aid Reveal platform um, to ensure that we're protecting people and, and data um, anywhere and everywhere that it goes across the world um, and then for, in terms of uh, referenceable sites there's huge organizations from from 50 um from 50 employees all the way to 500,000 employees that use the a reveal platform from anything from a next generation dlp to an insider threat to a user behavior analytics solution um to a security education awareness platform um all built in a in a single level but i won't take stephen uh, stephen's thunder when he talks through the architecture in a little while but for, for all intents and purposes, as we, as we named at the top of the conversation, user behavior is key. Um, a lot's changed for a lot of uh, every organization globally over the last 12 to 18 months for one reason or another. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic's caused a lot of organizations to stand up and look at kind of how users are actually genuinely acting when they're working from home. We promote a zero trust model, but why don't we trust employees to do the necessary and effective work? That they may once know why is it they're always deemed malicious rather than just unintentional actors um there's a great analogy here and we use it every time we get in a seatbelt uh, in a car we put on our seatbelt um we wear a helmet when we bike ride we check the streets for cars before crossing the streets because it's all enacted within the human brain once we teach them to do the right things once we put the appropriate tools responsibilities in front of them to then make better decisions so why don't we do this in the cyber security world why do we always deem that zero trust is the way? Why do we not trust our users? Um, not all of them are malicious. For sure, we've seen a number of incidents happen throughout Australia, throughout um, throughout Europe, throughout the US um, over the last 12 months with ransomware, with cybersecurity attacks, with DDoS attacks, et cetera, et cetera. But the human error always and always will be uh, the most common way that we open a door to hackers, whether it's clicking on an unknown link, unintentionally sharing information externally, and, and this is where people know that it's easy to exploit the user. So if we make the user part of the, um, the solution rather than part of the problem, then is that really the best the way that we can go about things? Oops. Apologies on my behalf. There we go. So the reason why we know this is we look at today's security challenges. So we look at the cyber threat defense report in 2020 or the IBM Ponemon report, the cost of a data breach last year, or the UK ICO. All these facts and figures have been um, aggregated and correlated from there. Throughout 2020 and, and, and considerably thereafter, 81% of companies have been compromised by a cyber attack. And everyone goes, what a cyber attack, what does that mean? Is that an external um, threat actor? Maybe, sometimes that's always the case. But unfortunately, we focus too much on the external rather than look at the internal, because a lot of the gaps as you do some digging in the due diligence into the, how it happened, it's all to do with a third party contractors with the internal um, unintentional user. Never 99, 95% is the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the unintentional, unmalicious actor. And we'll always get that 5% of disgruntled actors throughout the organization. But if you look at the human attack uh, vector on, on this graph, 90%, over 90% involve human attack vectors, which is 10 times simpler to remediate and redact to mitigate against if you put the right solutions in place. And that's not just a technology, that could be people and processes as well, with technology being the benefactor. 
And then if we look at personal information, we've all got our own legislation when it comes to um, privacy. And 80% of security breaches include PII, which is, as you all well, very much well know, is a big no-no when it comes to data security and data protection. Ultimately, that's the crown jewels there. It's our gold, it's our oil. And we need to get better at understanding how the user's interacting with the data. How are they sharing it? Uh, are they always doing the right thing? Or are they just trying to actually do their job role in which they were once hired for? And if we break this down into, into common um, themes across the industries, common attacks on you and your employees include deep fakes, spear phishing, uh, cash poisoning, denial, denial of server, router hacking, malware, uh, I should say ransomware rather than randomware, uh, web attacks, waterhole attack, invoice scam, wire fraud. This happens more and more um, as, as we see it. If you look at router hacking, everyone goes, router hacking? We're not even in the office. How, how is this not a thing? Well, actually, it's more prevalent now than ever. Everybody's working from home, working remotely. A lot of people still aren't fully back to the office. And we see it so, so often where users working from home do not even have the password on their home router and their home Wi-Fi. Or if they do, it's password one, two, three, and it's easily uh, manipulated to get around. Well, if a person gets into said um, user's Wi-Fi and they get access to their desktop, and they essentially, and that person's connected to a VPN or at least to the internal network, then it gives direct access to you and your organization's infrastructure. We don't want this. And this is where users become a little bit um, inadvertently, shall we say, um, a little bit reticent to understand kind of how, it, how important security is to, to us as an organization, because we've not necessarily involved them as part of the champions. And what's been successful is actually incorporating users as part of that, creating champions, making it part of their DNA. I know here for sure at Ava, um, we ensure that every, every one of our employees has 100% awareness in terms of what we're looking to address, whether it be part of our ISO accreditation, whether it be part of users just not having to click on uh, phishing attacks, et cetera, et cetera, um, to ensure that the, the organization is better protected against all forms of threats across the industry. So I'll pause there. Um, at this point in time, we'll, we'll get down to the first whiskey tasting. This is where I will hand over to Sharon and Andy from Hellier's Road. Well, welcome to our boardroom here at Hellier's Road. It's, uh, thank you for letting us join you. It's an unusual thing to do. I think you might have set a trend here. So Hellier's Road Whiskey was established in uh, 1999, really, by a group of dairy farmers who owned uh, better milk. So uh, they decided as a board that they would get together and start making whiskey, which was a very bold thing to do. So Hellier's Road started making whiskey in the early 2000s and went to market in 2006, very proudly with its first whiskey. Uh, we've got a couple of our favorites here that we're, we'll be going through. Sharon Dean is with me. She's our visitor center manager. And uh, we've uh, become the, the, the third whiskey distillery in Tasmania. And uh, we're out in the, uh, in the northwest of Tas. So we've got the, the freshest water and the cleanest air, and it's a little bit cold as well. So uh, great place to make whiskey, just like Scotland. So which one are we drinking first, Sharon? Um, I have poured our original whiskey, so I hope everyone who's joining in has poured theirs as well. And I just thought I'd quick talk through a little bit of our, our whiskey. Um, so the, our original whiskey is um, a non-age table whiskey, generally around five to seven years of age. You'll find that it's very light and delicate um, in colour. Um, we don't actually add any colour. It has been aged in American white oak casks that have come from America. So if you have a little swirl, you'll sort of see those beautiful colours, little golden hue coming through. On the nose, you'll pick up some vanilla and some citrus notes coming through. And that is very um, much from the time in the in the American white oak. Um, this particular whiskey is presented at 46.2%, so it's a little bit higher than other whiskies. The reason being we don't actually chill filter the whisky um, because we've taken all that time for it to develop its colour and flavour and we want to leave as much in there as we can. So we might just have a little taste. So you probably pick up some um, lovely sweetness at the front of the palate there. A little bit like a lolly to me. I'm not sure if you're getting that, Andy. Some vanilla and some yeah. um, subtle citrus tones. And then 
probably just getting a little bit of warmth coming through into the palette. It's a very typical style from Ellie's Road. We actually have a lot of contact with the copper in our di distillation process, which strips sulfate out. And this gives us a very soft, rounded flavour to our whiskies, which is very typical and, and tends to go through the range. So there's a lot of sweetness and well balanced um, flavours that you can get a peppery finish as well, which is um, it's good length on the whisky. I take no credit for making the whiskies, but I think our guys do a good job. Eh? And that's the original. Perfect. Thanks for that, guys. I'm I'm actually very jealous uh, at this point in time because obviously I I've not had the uh, the um the thankful gift of getting some whiskey across here, but I'm a big fan of it. Um, hopefully at one point when we can travel again, I can come and see you guys, um, and and we can we can try some together. But hey, we'll we'll plow on for now, and I'll, I'll just I'll sit with my coffee at this time in the morning in the UK. And sorry, Nick, it's Sarah here. I'd just like to quickly say when we get to the second tasting, Dan will open up to any questions that we might also have for Helia's Road as they're coming through. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so yeah, as as we as we go on, you guys, I hope you guys are enjoying um, the whiskey. Um, not jealous at all, not even a little bit. <laughs> um, obviously, we'll, we'll carry on talking about securing the organisation with your people, as I alluded to before. Um, and what we do is we we focus on a, a very quick analogy called deep. Um, we want to discover the risks that, that are exposed to our organization, enforce the policies. We all have IT usage, acceptable usage policies, uh, data privacy policies, et cetera, et cetera, across the organization, but we, we need to better enforce them and actually make them part of reality. And to do that, we also need to educate the employees that actually they're, they're part of the, the solution, not necessarily part of the problem. And then ultimate goal here is to, to prevent against data loss. What, whatever data type that might be, whether it's PII, whether it's IP, whether it's secret source, et cetera, et cetera, or, or in Elias Road um, instance, it might be their secret ingredients. You never know. And, and then obviously, but ultimately, we want to protect against exactly what um, we deem our own intellectual property to make us better uh, business. And within the Avery Reveal platform, we focus on, on deep human centric data loss prevention uh, protection which incorporates self-learning UVA and, and proactive defense technology. And, we, and like I said, we break this down into four common components. We have a risk detector that has the ability to identify and track risks on entities of interest. That's all users uh, across endpoints and server estate, Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, that we need to understand if it's, even if it's moving or changing a file or connecting to a specific DNS, we need to better understand why the user is doing that because they're not always malicious. But we need to ensure that the user are actually maintaining their best practice and their workflow as they typically should do. The cyber educator, it's incident based training to reduce the attack service, real time incident based training rather than your um, mundane quarterly annually CBT that people forget within weeks or uh, days and, and just want to go back to their their actual work, uh, their work and, and do what they feel is right for their for their job role. The policy enforcer, we talked about. Um, AUP or ITP, et cetera, et cetera, before, um, we need to ensure and demonstrate policy compliance. When it comes to things like GDP, GDPR or the Australian and defense legislation, we, we need to make sure that actually we can correlate and aggregate back this when it comes to the auditors and making sure that we can actually prove and understand that actually we've, we've incorporated a cyber maturity model and we've improved across, um, across the tenure or the length of time that actually invoked these policies. And the data protector preventing data loss and IP theft, as I mentioned at the top of the call. All these combined with analyst services, whether driven by community cloud, whether driven by ourselves, or whether even we train you guys up internally within your internal SOC or, or shared security services to, to help and, and provide better cyber hygiene, tailor the, the AV Reveal platform, tailor the solution, accelerate threat hunting in a way that just was never done before. So if we break these down into those components, we look at human-centric DLP. The reason why we look at it like this is because we need to incorporate the end user, not just from a policy perspective, but the common and the lock and the lacking functionality for legacy solutions in the market is it was very it's quite binary um, in terms of it either looked at the data or the user or the systems. Well, why couldn't we put in an effective data prevention solution that could incorporate? what the user's doing 
how they're doing it, what data are they touching as they're doing it, and which systems are they transferring or transmitting those actions across. So actually utilizing and baseline user behavior over the space of a couple of weeks improves dramatically um, the risk metric and the profile of the organization to get better understanding whilst also correlating that with the internal policies. And then incorporating that with the identification of the risks and the tracks of the entities of interest, ensuring that actually we've got the entities of interest while we can, um, we can kind of put to the back of our mind as an organization where interest may not necessarily be as high when we look at the risk metric and the profile within the business, providing a nice um, a high level overview and detailed overview, should I say, uh, around where and why these risks are being detected and within which BU, within which geography, uh, within which department, et cetera. And then the educator, proactive real real time training. We need to have the ability to block social engineering attacks, pretexting, phishing, um, increase cyber maturity and, and create positive security culture. The user's not always doing something bad. We figure that out. We just need to understand which users are or which are or which users are just uneducated and how can we make that help them make better decisions when they're going about their day-to-day -day job role. The enforcer, um, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have the ability to monitor and improve adherence to internal standards, whether it's HIPAA, PCI, ISO, GDPR, many different legislations and compliance across the organizations, across the industry, across the world. Uh, we could actually cover them all if you really wanted to. But utilizing out of the box policy packs, um, over 100 of them, and configuring and making sure that we can comply with some of, um, well, with, with, with all of your uh, policies as well, we can document the actual compliance and the formal security and privacy frameworks. We can provide those back to the risk board and help them understand how we are better putting in controls and how we're complying and adhering to these requirements and these regulatory frameworks um, within the business. And the data protector, the immediate response is what everybody looks for. Having the ability to take a screenshot, understand how users are acting, um, not necessarily monitoring their work. That's not what we want to do. We want to trigger and take screenshots on um, our, on policy and, and rule inadvertent um, actions. We need to display the message utilizing the real-time incident-based training, kill the process as it were, if, if users are accidentally sharing um, information across Teams or Zoom, et cetera. It happens more often than we think, or even USB. A lock, block, isolate, as we mentioned, but having the ability to utilize that and do that across the entire infrastructure, whether it be email, web, or a relevance of which OS that you want to use, having full visibility across all these actions and preventing against them is, is key and is what's a core component to a lot of, um, uh, of organizations' data protection policy. And the key unique advantages of, of AVA is we, there's a lot of uh, technologies and information security vendors out there for sure. Um, a lot of them are focused on the external threats coming in, who we work with as well. We have a huge ecosystem. Um, as it mentioned here, we have an open ecosystem to actually utilize so things like CrowdStrike and CyberEason from an EDR perspective, SIEM solutions, uh, privilege access management solutions. We're focused on insider threat and next generation data loss prevention to make better, richer context um, analytics to then work with these ecosystem partners where they're more focused on other areas of um, of the infrastructure. But utilizing that open ecosystem gives us better understanding in terms of where people are working, understanding in, uh, instant protection, having a lightweight agent, utilizing the powerful search via the threat hunting and privacy mode. We get asked the question all the time is how do we ensure that users aren't reading or uh, looking at the wrong information. Well, role-based access control is built within the organization. And if users are actually truly trying to access the data, then we'll pick up on it because we can track every part of their, their action and activity based on the policies and rule sets that we create within the platform. And now I'll um, I'll hand back to, uh, to Sharon Andy at Helios Road. A bit of apologies to you, Nick. Now, one of the questions we often get asked, of course, is about the, the heritage of our brands and the name, Hellier's Road. And this is really where the, the second authentic story comes in. Henry Hellier was a, a pioneer in these areas. He arrived in Tasmania in 1826, and by the early 30s, he was out um, uh, exploring the land. So he was employed by the Van Diemen's Land Company. Uh, and he was an excellent surveyor. 
uh, as well as an architect, and uh, he sort of named 400 places in the northwest of Tasmania and forged his way through. One of his original roads, actually, in the 1830s, the early 1830s, actually cut straight through our campus where the distillery and where the, the dairy production facilities are. So it actually goes straight through where we are. So uh, we have a, a famous person who's forged the way through in the same way I think these dairy farmers forged their way through to make wonderful whiskey. And this one is actually my personal favorite. So as I enjoy it, I'll let Sharon talk about it. Thanks, Andy. It's actually one of my personal favorites too. And, and actually the first whiskey that I could enjoy neat um, and straight when I was learning about drinking whiskey. So um, I drink it um, without adding any water or ice, but you know, it is up to the person drinking it if they'd like to add a drop of water or other things. So, um, but this particular whiskey, you'll notice it's a little bit deeper in color than the original. And that is because this particular whiskey has had time in American white oak. And then after a period of time, five to seven years, it's transferred um, into the whiskey's tipped and transferred into Pinot Noir casks. So in Tasmania, we are a Pinot Noir wine region, which is a red wine. So you can sort of see that red pink hue coming through from, from the time in the, in the um, it's actually French oak, but it's um, Pinot Noir casks. Um, so this particular whiskey, very much this, uh, similar to the um, original, but you'll notice a bit more of a peppery, peppery notes in there. So you'll still get the vanilla and the citrus coming through, light in style, sweet, and then you'll get a little bit of a peppery finish. I just like to sip it and um, you can actually chew whiskey, which will give you some more flavours in your mouth. So if you hold it in your mouth and then swallow it and then chew, it'll actually release a few more flavours as well. But that one you might notice it'll be a little bit different. It's a little bit softer probably than the original, I think, today. This one we're trying. I know it's, uh, it's got that lovely rounded softness that is, is typical of, of Hallie's Road whiskies that we're very proud of. This is a unique proposition there. Uh, still getting the caramel notes, but I can pick out that, that Pinot. It does give it a, a fruity edge. And um, and it does have a peppery finish. It's uh, become a very good friend to me. This one. And they say with your first sip, when you're trying whiskey, you should swill it in your mouth for about ten seconds. It's quite a discipline to do. I'm, uh, I'm already looking for my next sip <laughs> within ten seconds. So, so that's our Pinot finish. Thank you, Andy. Uh, at this point, we don't have any new questions. They look like there might have been one from Shooky, but we did have lots of comments to say this has been perfect for such a cold day to be tasting whiskey in the afternoon. So we'll just wait a few more minutes in case there's any other questions from the group. If you could just pop them into the chat. And yes, we do do this every afternoon. <laughs> Um, hey. We actually have quite a range of whiskies available. If people would like to jump on the website, they'll see, you know, we have some older whiskies um, and and the original and the Pinot and different. Um, and we are also making creme liqueur, which is like a bad, uh, I'd say like a bad, it is like a bad, but it's yeah, um, that, style. We, that style. We actually use our cream, we access it from the dairy, uh, the, the milk business, and make a creme liqueur, which is very popular as well. Thanks, Sharon. We do actually have a question. We're going to open up the line for Jonathan Mack. Over to you, Jonathan. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for um, running the um, tasting session. Um, Tasmanian whiskey, just in general, I think has come from, I wouldn't say nowhere, but it carries quite a, a story behind it. I'm just interested where it came from and what's, what's the sort of characteristics that make it so successful sort of locally and globally? Yes, um, it was actually um, illegal to make whiskey in Tasmania. It was outlawed uh, probably 150 years ago, would you believe? And uh, a very famous uh, character called Bill Lark actually challenged the law and was given, uh, reversed it. And he was the first to make whiskey, and that was Lark's, followed by Sullivan's Cove, and then followed by, uh, by Hellier's Road. Um, 
I think what we did is we emulated the Scottish style uh, of how to make whiskey. We used um, we used predominantly American white oaks. They do use some European oak, uh, and we use exactly the same rules and regulations. So we don't add anything to the whiskey. It's the barley and the yeast and, and the water, and of course we do statistically have a fantastic climate, the best and purest rainwater, and uh, and of course the um, the air is statistically the cleanest. So we've got all those cues that we can add to. We've got a climate that's very similar uh, and allows that the, the maturation of the whiskey to get in and out as it gets hotter and colder. So um, I think we've, uh, we've we've emulated the, the Scottish grapes and, and, and I've had a very disciplined industry. And, uh, we're, not, uh, we're very proud of what we do, I think, and it's a good fraternity in Tasmania. We're all good mates. Thanks, Andy. I hope that's answered your questions, Jonathan. Looks like that might be all the questions for the time being. Please keep them coming through. We can answer them at the end of the session as well. So on that note, thank you, um, Sharon and Andy, and I will now hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Nick. So before we go into the demonstration, it's probably best to explain how the AVA architecture works and how it all fits together. So as Nick's alluded to, the AVA Reveal platform is agent-based technology. It's an endpoint solution uh, that sits on the actual device that you're looking to monitor and works across your laptop, your desktop, or your server, and supported also across Windows, Linux, and Mac operating systems. Now, it is very lightweight. I know a lot of people say that, and it's, <laughs> they turn out not to be, but it is a, it is a very lightweight agent that sits at that kernel level. It normally takes up around about 2 to 3% of your CPU processing power in the background. Also, the benefit of running at that kernel level is it doesn't interfere with any other agents or any other software applications that you're running on your device because it's operating underneath there. Now, once the agent is deployed onto the device that you're looking to monitor, the first thing it does, as long as it can communicate, is it talks back to the AVA Reveal cloud. So this is where all of the smarts and the, the machine learning components are. And as soon as it starts running, the first thing it starts doing is actually collecting things like data events, user events, and system events. Now this could be anything from a screenshot being taken, files being accessed, things like SaaS applications such as Dropbox or OneDrive um, being accessed, but it also then looks and gets the context behind this <clears throat> through user events. So this comes into the behavioral analytics, um, what logins have been um, requested, what locations the user's pretty much logging into and keystroke items, things like that. The last part is the system event. So this is that really binary level. So it's looking at the actual processes that is running on the device itself. What, is there any kind of system commands um, that have been running in the back end? What connections the devices are making out, both internally in the network and to external networks as well. Now, the actual agent has two components to it. The first one is the policy engine, and we'll co I'll cover a lot of this in further further down the track in the actual demonstration, but the policy engine is pretty much the written rules. This is the things that we can map to your acceptable use policies or your, um, your infosec policies, that side of items. And it comes with around about 130 of these out of the box that are pre-configured as well. So things like good cyber hygiene um, policies, that, that side of it. The other half of the, uh, the agent as well runs on machine learning. So what it does is for the first seven to 14 days, it actually sits there and learns what the device is doing and how the user actually operates that device. And then after the 14 day period, it starts then will start reporting back and alerting on things that are outside of the norm. So this could be anything like a user's logging in from a different location all the way through to that user has been typing in username and passwords, but it's seen keystroke injections because it understands how the actual user types. The AVI, uh, sorry, the AVA Reveal Cloud also has API integration. So it has an open API framework with web, web hooks, which means we can plug it into things like a SIEM, if you have one of those already, or any other third party application. So it could be ticketing systems such as ServiceNow and the likes. 
Once it's running, as I mentioned, obviously it's collecting these data events and all it's doing initially is monitoring. And that may be enough for some organizations. They may just want to monitor this, not alert the end user and just pretty much find and report on the fact and allow backend analysts or anything else to investigate these items. However, the powerful part of Ava as well is when it comes to actually taking actions. This is the protection side of it. So for example, it can display a message and we'll see this a lot in our demonstration because that's pretty much the only action that I'm going to be taking. But it also allows you to lock or isolate the device, allows you to kill processes that are running if it's detected and even take screenshots of what the user is doing before and after the event. So before we go any further, I will move on to the demonstration. And then after that, we'll go into having a quick look in the actual end user portal as well for your agents to have a look at. Okay, so here we have a Amazon workspace, which represents the, the user device or the server that you're looking to monitor. Now, obviously, I'm not going to take you through everything today, but this gives a, a good representation of some of the things that is achieved through this. Now, obviously, there's other items such as logging on to insecure Wi-Fi endpoints, things like that. I can't display that today, obviously, because um, we'd lose network connection. But this should give you a good overall view of what's, what's achievable through the platform. So like any organization, you are going to have certain uh, sensitive files, and they could be stored locally on your device, or they could be stored in your corporate areas such as OneDrive. So for example, here we're logging onto a, the corporate OneDrive. This is a sanctioned application. The user's all, all okay to access it and he's got his credentials here. Now if we go into documents, we'll see that there are a number of sensitive files here. Um, for example, the Ava Reveal Roadmap, that's, let's say that's personal, that's um, some IP for your organization. So let's download that locally to the PC. We've got some online transactions here with credit card information. Let's download that as well. And let's let's go for the x-ray as well, just in case you've got some images that you want to protect as well. So let's download that locally as well. As you can see, all of these files have been downloaded and pretty much the, the credentials for the user allow us all of this. Now, obviously users, um, you can have malicious users that are trying to exfiltrate information, but also you, you can have users that maybe are unaware of policies, a bit of um, ne neglect in there as to what they can and can't do. There may be a bit of kind of shadow IT going on. This application is here to really more, not just police and report against people with malicious activity, but also point them in the right direction as well for existing users, because sometimes they just don't know what the latest policies are. Maybe the, their, their security awareness training is not 100% up to date. Um, and this is how we, we kind of hold their hand during this process as well. So we've downloaded, obviously, the sensitive files to locally to the PC. Now, some organizations, for example, may have a corporate communications technology such as Microsoft Teams or WebEx or anything else like that. Now, this may be the sanctioned application to have that messaging um, between employees or with external participants, but you may not want to actually send sensitive information on there. Now, what we can do and what this is a demonstration of is the Ava agent actually inspects content in transit. So it's not just looking at things like tags, which we, we can do. We can get it to look at uh, things like Microsoft information um, protection or anything else like that, which is tagging devices, sensitive files, but it's actually looking at the content that's in the file itself. So for example, if I go to attach and upload a file from my PC, I click on, on online transactions, I click open, and there we get it. We get a policy box that pops up that says, do not share this document externally as it contains credit card information. So it's actually seen that credit card information in there. Now this could be credit card information. It could be national insurance numbers. It could be driver's license details. And Ava has a whole um, host of these um, scripts that look for this information that's already in there. But we can also then program custom ones on, on requests if there's any specific file format or data format that we need to look at. Now, at the moment, we're just playing a message. We can block this. We can take a screenshot so that we can report on what the user is doing. We can even isolate and lock the device. In this sense, however, just for the demonstration purposes, we're just looking at notifying the user. 
Now, what we can do as well is each one of these is customizable. So we can customize this actual message here, but we can also add in a URL such as this one, which then takes you to your corporate um, policies page, which could be a specific policy document, it could be a training document, or in this sense, it's just a, an overview um, HR people and policies intranet site for the user. And these are all customized per policy. I'm gonna close this one down, click okay. I'm gonna click cancel here, because obviously we're not blocking this, we're just looking at it. So the next one is obviously is as people are working remotely or even just when they're in the office, uh, there's a lot of shadow IT going on. So it may be a case of somebody wants to use Slack when obviously your organization doesn't use it. They've all got good intentions. They're trying to use it for work. They don't really understand the fact that if they sanction another IT or they upload a sensitive file or any sort of file whatsoever to a third party application without IT's knowledge, then it, it obviously um, introduces a security risk. So for example, if we were wanting to go to uh, one of the common ones, such as we transfer, and we can actually in browser block files. So this is not really looking at the content anymore, although we can do, which we can just put a, a specific block all on uploading any of these documents. So for example, if I go to Ava reveal roadmap, click okay. And then again, it comes up against company policy, uploads to this domain and not allowed. Now we can whitelist um, certain domains that you want to. So for example, you may have things like Salesforce where people need to upload documents to, um, but and zero and things like that. But other applications we can obviously block. Moving on, once this closes down, we go on to the next piece. So this is uploading hidden sensitive files. So for example, if you did have a user that is <clears throat> maliciously trying to exfiltrate information, this is where that um, content inspection really comes into play. So for example, if we open up our files and go to the downloads, and for example, we see the one here, which is online transactions. So if I open this document now, albeit in Spanish, you'll also see that it contains a lot of credit card information. Now, for example, let's try and get this off this and send via our personal Gmail account off the actual network itself. So if I create a copy of this document now, actually let's not even, actually let's, let's create a copy. Let's create a copy of it. That work. And let's rename this one to shopping list. Okay, so the documents now not being looked has been obviously copied to a shopping list. It still contains the credit card information in there as it is now. And let's try and get it off this. So an organization may not want to block things like access to Gmail so people can access their personal email on their uh, work environment. However, you still want to be able to stop sensitive information leaving your organization. So for example, here we've gone into a personal Gmail account for this demo user. And we're going to compose a new email and see if we can attach that file. So if we go to the shopping list now and click open, again, we're coming back up with that credit card information that's being detected. Now, because it's running at obviously the kernel level as well, as well we can check for uh, as it's trying to encrypt these things and, and you'll get that message as well. So next line on the agenda is how do we copy some of the sensitive information? So for example, a user may open up the online transactions and see that this information or a document is, for example, this one's in Spanish, they want, to, they want to read it in English. And it could be a huge document. So they copy all of the text and then they're going to paste it into something like Google Translate. Again, this is not malicious. This is just them trying to copy some information and read it in a, in a different language. Now, if we, oh, I'm able to edit in here. I'm going to add this to a clipboard. We click copy. And we can actually see here now it's coming up saying you're trying to copy credit card details. Now, obviously, this wasn't a malicious item. This is me doing it by accident. I can also put in a request in here to, to say that the user acknowledges this and allows them to put some feedback into whoever's monitoring this. So 
Oops, sorry, I didn't. Oop, can't roll. See the credit card info. And I acknowledge that it was a bad thing to do. So this is actually stopping you from copying this and pasting information or sensitive information into another document or into an RDP session or anything else that you're trying to do to it. Now, the last one here as well is obviously one way to exfiltrate information is if we had that credit card information up or any other sensitive information up, we could take a screenshot of this and um, send it as an image because then the, the content inspection is not actually going to see as part of the image, the text that's being copied on the screen. However, what we can do is part of this is we can either a block screenshots, which may not be feasible for your organization because people may use it or have valid reason to use it, or it can actually look and inspect the actual file name or the, the Windows browser name and what it's on, such as if it was on a payroll system, that side of things, and block screenshots then. So for example, if I go into uh, Windows, the snipping tool, to take any sort of screenshot now, you'll see that it allows me to take a screenshot of what's on the screen because it's not containing any sensitive files or applications. However, let's not say that. If I go into, say, the X-ray and open this file up, this could be considered sensitive information because it's an X-ray of patient information or anything else like that. If I now try and go through the snipping tool, and open this up now, you can see that screenshots taken have been monitored and it's detecting the sensitive information on the screen. Now, again, I'm just playing a message, but we can block this. Now, I think I alluded to it before, this could be the names of this, but it could also be taken from um, tags within say your Microsoft um, backend that limits and says this is confidential or it could be highly sensitive information or any, any of that information. And it automatically blocks these things from happening when it's there. And then there's other items which we can look at as well. So for example, one of the issues with remote working and taking devices home is obviously some people may allow their kids to have a, uh, have a turn on the computer and use it to do things like browsing YouTube, all that information. However, it is still obviously a threat and an attack vector where people can um, gain entry into your organization. So for example, if we wanted to search on certain things, we can even do um, inspection of what people are searching on, such as I'm a fan of Game of Thrones. Thrones, can't spell. And I want a torrent on this. Let's have a look at that and see if I can get the latest torrent. Okay, it's now detecting that it's against company policy. And this is the sort of information we can really drill down into and allow certain aspects uh, to be blocked or at least inform the user that it's not allowed. So the last part of this really is understanding that it is looking at the desktop um, from that kernel level. So for example, it can stop, although some people will stop applications being installed through policy um, it can also, just in case that's obviously circumvented, detect it from the device as well. It can also stop applications from being used. So if you're seeing within your organization that certain applications are being used and you need to stop it, you can then block the applications from running from that policy across the whole organization. So for example, this one here, TeamViewer, is a wonderful remote desktop um, application. We are not going to allow that to our users because obviously people can remote desktop into this and see sensitive information. So if I go to run this again, it's shown that it's an unauthorized application. Now we can whitelist the applications that you want and block everything else, or you can have, a, well, I would say a path somewhere between that. And we can look at it, and inspect each and every application that we run across this. Awesome. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump across to our portal and show you some of the back end of this and what you can see from the from the agent, uh, not from the agent side, from the actual portal side.
So here we have the Ava Reveal portal. So this is the landing page. As you can see, it's obviously recognizing me, saying hello, and gives you a little bit of a, an overview here. So you can see all the, the most risky users and nodes in the deployment. These scores here against the, the actual device itself, or if you've got LDAP integration, you can actually see it against the user. These scores here are based around how they're actually um, operating based on policies, any sensors that are being triggered, that side of things. So you can see a score line here. We've got a brief overview of all of this, obviously the policy violation, and then any of the open cases that we've got open today. Now, I'll probably work from the bottom up because it makes a bit more sense. So if we come here, this is uh, the deployment page and shows you exactly what's deployed within your tenancy for your organization. So you can see we've got 83 devices. We've got around about 31 of those with no user associated. So they are just devices. And then 52 of these are actually user associated. So we can actually see who belong, who actually um, owns the device that it, and what it belongs to. We can see the versions of the agents on the software. We can see the operating systems that they're operating across and we can see where these users are as well. So this is a nice general overview. We've moved on to the policy page. So as mentioned before, the policies um, is half of what the agent's actually running on. So these are the written rules of what um, we're, we're actually gonna create alerts or uh, sensor violations against. So out of the box, it comes with five main policy groups. The first one is the anti-tamper. So this stops people from being able to uninstall the agent or edit the agent, delete that, that side of things. The next four are the real, the real main ones that come out of the box. And they're broken down into four main categories. So one's the, the attack indicators. So this is showing things like um, malicious, well, events that are caused by things like malicious actors or anything else that's happening at that level. The next one is the cyber hygiene. So this is a list of good cyber hygiene um, principles that we can report on. And as you can see here, when you click into it, it breaks down into it. So we have a whole list of ones here. You can see the grayed out ones are the ones that are not actually in operation at the moment and the ones that are darker here. Now these numbers on the side show what level of sensitivity or what level um, we want to raise this as a violation. One being a low use one, such as an unauthorized USB storage device inserted. And then you've got more sensitive ones like a sensitive files open, which is 90. Now these alerts will obviously pop up in here and you can see a big um, long list of them up here at the top. Now in each one of these things like, um, let me pick a good one. We can go to unauthorized website visited. So once you click onto the policy, you can see it's very customizable on the inside. So we can come in here, we can say, these are some of the unauthorized domains. So we can actually add domains that we don't, we want to block or we want to report to say you're not allowed to access. And then we can configure the sensor. So I may think that if it's one of these ones that I add in here, that for example, it could be a gambling site or it could be a torrent site or anything else. I may want to change the score to say 90 so that it, it, it becomes more severe and is higher up in my reporting. We can also put a descriptions in here and then at the bottom, which is what I alluded to before, covers pretty much all of the action configuration. So we can click to display a message and customize that, put the header in and the body, whatever you want it to be. And every time that somebody on accesses an unauthorized website, that's the message that's going to be displayed. We can also then say we want to isolate the device, lock it, take a screenshot or reboot the host, <clears throat> depending on what actions you want to take for it. And obviously these are the policy packs that come out of the um, out of the box. Let's just leave. Um, that covers pretty much these four and the data tracking and the insider risk piece. Now, what we can do is we can create new policy groups and we can add subsets of people into it. So you can see here's a whole heap of things that are not out of the box that we've put in before. So it's got 100% customizable. Then the other side of this, we have the behavioral analytics. So this is, um, this is the actual artificial intelligence or the machine learning side of it. So as you can see here, we have a training period. It's at one at the moment. Normally it's around about 14 days. And here we can go through and say, okay, how do we, um, how do we change the, the actual sensor score as and when these things are here? 
such as surgeon inbound connections, we may want to increase that to a, to something more critical, like that 90 to 100 space, or we may want to reduce it further. Once these are actually triggered, or a number of these are triggered in a row, then that's that's the part which then reports back and says these are unknown behaviors that the device is actually um, showing or, or the end users trying to achieve something. Now, this part is the, the part which is pretty useful for most of management and also for your security analysts as well. So policy reports. Now, this is quite um, a, a powerful page. So this shows all of the violations at the moment. But it's also what we can do is we can change this instantly as well. So we could say this is today, but let's look at, say, yesterday and what happened on here. So we can see a breakdown of the report. I can click on one of these and I can go into the violations that happened at that time. So you can see them by either policy or by user or by the actual device node itself. Now, we can also customize a lot of these things as well. So things like the custom reports we can have around data loss prevention. So anyone uploading files or anybody sending emails or anything, or it could be we're looking at people using Gmail and what they're doing there. Or it could even be a case of we're running a security awareness campaign and there's certain policies we want to report on, and this is what we, we create here. So you can see here we click into this part as well. And again, we can see on the, the security awareness campaign, but also instantly we can see what's happened over the last month again and get the actual analysts out of this as well. Now, the, the big piece here is we've seen it by user. And we can also do it by node, by source IP, by a whole host of, uh, sorry, a whole host of other information in here. Now, if we were to find something that we um, wanted to investigate more, <clears throat> then what we can do is we can add it to a case. Now, cases are um, little folders that we go and collect um, evidence of what's actually occurred at, at that point. So for example, somebody uploading documents or possible data exfiltration IP theft, and there's somewhere where the analyst can go and investigate, add all the evidence into it and in a wonderful forensic timeline. And then when it's finished, we can close the case down. Now, when we go to this part here, which is the forensic part, this is the part which is, I would say, incredibly detailed uh, you can get a lot of information or you, you can have a high level information so as you see here we can see all of the users on the world map again this is the last month if you want to say what's happened today as you can see there's obviously less there's less people being active today so far now our device that we were looking at is down here running out of our aws um, instance in sydney i click on this and it takes me to the actual device itself so what I can see now is my activity feed. So here's all the different things that this device has been working on. So if I look at all of them and I look at today, you can see all the way down from what applications run, what connections have been made. Is there anything else in here that's fun to look at? DNS queries, all of that information. And as you can see, it's on this wonderful timeline. And what we can also do Let's make sure we've got enough information in here. Is we can then break this down and look and hone in on individual things. So, for example, let me have a look at the connections that this device has made over the past month. And here we are here. So it's starting to see the outbound connections, the system, the teams. Obviously, this is a demonstration uh, device, so it's not making a lot of connections, but all of that information's in here. Now. What we then can do is investigate each one of these a little bit more, and it gives you more information around here. So for example, an outbound connection has been made, that was the source node, the IP address, we use TCP IP, and then <clears throat> this is the process that, process that was calling it. So it can go to minute detail to build up an event, or at least a timeline of what was going on. Now, I'm not, <clears throat> we obviously can't cover everything because this is a very powerful, um, I would say there's a very powerful agent and also portal to, to investigate. But what we can do is if anybody wants to have a specific demonstration or a discussion around specific use cases, it could be anything from data loss prevention through to I want some 
compliance on um, compliance reporting on policies, then please reach out and we can make a time and go through that with you. So that concludes the demonstration today, but um, I will hand back over to Nick. Thank you. Very well done, Stephen, to be honest. I think um, for, for those guys who are wanting more, there's a, a million and one things that we can demonstrate in terms of policies. Um, like like Stephen alluded to, don't don't feel free to, um, don't hesitate, sorry, should I say, in terms of reaching out, I'm more than happy to, to run additional demonstrations. Awesome. Okay, let's hand over some questions and see what's been asked. Lovely, that's Lee here from Community Cloud. Just, uh been collecting the questions along the way this afternoon. So first one we have, uh, where do you prioritise security education and awareness in the risk and compliance agenda? Sorry, Lee, would you repeat that again for me, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. So we've got, where do you prioritise security education and awareness in the risk and compliance agenda? Um, I think so from from experience when when working with different organizations, it's it's always there and thereabouts at the top. Um, because if we talk about kind of the three components about people, process, and technology, people always come first. Um, so if you're looking at the kind of five steps to majority, uh, it's always typically one or two. And the reason for that is because users are, as I mentioned earlier, users aren't always malicious. Sometimes they're just uneducated. And it's us as employers, um, as IT professionals, as security professionals, to provide them with a better education because unfortunately if they're not necessarily involved in the security practice it's not necessarily something that's at the forefront of their mind however if we deliver them the detail sorry should i say the devil in the detail when it comes to security and the ramifications that can be expected after the fact then they typically start to invoke and uh, mitigate against any potential risks that are associated so when it talks to risk and compliance register uh, it's normally one or two in my opinion Stephen, anything to add on that Sorry, just some muting. No, look, that pretty much covers the majority of what we are. And um, what I would also add to this as well is I, I've been in discussion with quite a few different organizations over, I would say, the last 12 months around security education as well. And it's something that which just keep coming up. So I would say a couple of years ago, most organizations are quite happy running that. Like I mentioned before, you, you do your annual assessment for compliance you see a video you answer a couple of multiple choice questions and that kind of ticks the box and it's expected that people remember this for the rest of the year um what a lot of organizations are seeing now is obviously that it is um this behavior is actually allowing back doors to be opened and regardless of the the security controls that you've got in place at the moment it it is allowing them to bypass some of this i mean for most most of the time, the path of least resistance will win for most users. So if there's something there which they can do, which is not necessarily the the process or the the application that they should be using, they'll still use it. So what we're looking at now is how do we do that in, in an awareness program? So use of the use of technology such as the the Ava um, platform to police, but also report as to what users or what groups of users are actually adhering to this and then be able to drill down and that's what's really catching a lot of attention from um it directors and from ctos and cios alike just to make sure that they can say okay we're, we're taking this further than just a compliance question it's how do i drill the actual mindset it into the mindset of the employee so that it's the security first um idea rather than a afterthought wonderful thanks gentlemen Next question, uh, how has remote working affected user behavior? Uh, this is an interesting one, right? Because we, we, we've had this quite a lot over the last 18 months um, and, and still continues to be as such. So when we talk about remote workforce, um, some people like myself, I've, I've worked remotely uh, mobile over the last 10, 12 years. Um, it's within my DNA, it's in, within my nature to understand kind of how that works. Uh, also, obviously, I'm very um, 
I'm privy to the fact of what security means to, to, to different organizations. However, when it comes to people who have now transitioned to working from home in the remote workforce, we've expanded, in my opinion, we've, we, that, that expansion has always been there because we've got mobile workforces, et cetera. Um, but we've expanded those four walls. The, why, why is it we now need a VPN to be able to connect to an internal network when we've got things like Google and Microsoft and, and different multi-factor authentication solutions that can do that without requiring a VPN? Because um, there's always a fine line between security and collaboration. Um, ultimately, the, the user just wants to be able to do their work and collaborate with um, whatever internal resources they've been able to address. However, we don't want to compromise on the security posture. So there's a number of different solutions out there that have been brought to fruition over the last 12 to 18 months and, and there before. Um, however, they've just not been able to keep up with time. There's been a lot of vendors out there that have actually realized that sitting at the network layer has, isn't as effective as it once was because people just aren't connecting to the network anymore because they're obviously connecting from a home network. So it's it's changed the mindset for a lot of organizations for sure. Um, it's changed the user's mindset in terms of actually can they be more effective. Um, it's for some reasons rightly, for some reasons wrongly, um, more so rightly, I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, but it, it has been an ultimate transition for a lot of IT security professionals, for sure. I might add a little bit onto that as well. So um, what we've seen a lot of as well is obviously everyone rapidly sent people to work from home when we went into lockdown. I mean, Australia, we weren't obviously as bad as anything that we've, we've seen in some other areas of the globe. but. A lot of organizations were set up for remote working, but not remote working on scale. So it was only specific user groups, say it was sales or it was certain certain areas within the business that could actually access it. Whereas there were certain areas of all the business, things like finance and people have taken payments or e even down to, um, I would say, agents taking credit card information, that side of things. And all of a sudden, we've had to push these people into um, a home working scenario with, with without, I wouldn't say, no thought, but with a accelerated thought about how do we secure them. So what, what we've seen a lot of in the last six months is obviously there was that mass push of people moving from home and there was a big push on giving them the tools to collaborate on people all of a sudden buying laptops and then running out and everything else like that. They're now starting to look at and take stock and work out what, what the next 12 months going to look like. If we come out of COVID, are those, all of those people going to come from uh, come back into the office? Is it just those departments which traditionally we didn't want working from home? Are they going to come back into the office? And how do we secure against them? So I would say yeah, I've even seen a, a trend in discussions I've had with customers 12 months ago when I was talking about insider risk um, and how do we actually work with remote workers. The, the emphasis has spiraled, I would say, in the last 12 months where now everyone wants to talk about it and understand what they can do to put in place, whereas I would say six to 12 months, months ago, it was a case of, look, I've just got people out there. I just want to make sure that they can actually do the job that they're supposed to be doing. So I would say it's it, it's going to be an interesting 12 to 24 months now um, to see how many of those users actually come back into the office and who can allow it. Are we just going to default back into privacy uh, rules that are a little bit more um, private, have to come back into an office, into a, an environment which has been watched? Or are we going to continue to allow them to operate from that, that remote working perspective? And if so, what do we do to make sure that we're, we're compliant against this and that we, we've got the right data protection in there and people aren't writing down credit card information on, on a pad of paper next to them as, as they're working from their home office, that side of it. Wonderful. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, another question here. Uh, what advice would you give to someone trying to implement this type of system? I might jump in here as a little bit yeah. as well. So I've, I've actually had this conversation with a customer today as well. So um, what I would, what we normally advise is we put it in, we roll it out across the, the devices and uh, that we actually want to monitor, but you put it into that monitoring mode. You don't become invasive. Because a lot of users, as soon as you start turning everything off, and I've seen this in my own uh, in in previous places, as soon as things get locked down too fast, too quickly, when maybe they've been a little bit more open in what you can and can't do on the machine, everybody starts um, panicking. I would say a little bit and thinking that oh, let's change the way I'm working, and all of a sudden, then you get a lot of people kind of pushing back on what's been implemented. Whereas I would say, 
the the, the easiest way or, or the, the fastest route to acceptance on this is really how do we map the the existing policies that they've got now to make sure that we can actually see what's going on in the network and get that visibility and then gradually over time start tightening the the, the controls around us obviously with whatever's the most important first but then it may be a case of you start displaying messages and just saying and, and giving people that reminder it's against policy to use I don't know, slack because it's not an approved application that side of things rather than just out now block it first time and then start easing into those controls um rather than the, the kind of the big bang approach and then opening certain things afterwards when you get that that pushback i mean nick you've obviously seen this probably a little bit more than me as well what's your thoughts on it no it's true um i think the the ultimate goal um or at least the, the ultimate starting point here is to set a baseline um, we don't know what we don't know is kind of where this begins when we talk next gen DLP insider risk. Um, we don't really know, especially with the remote workforce question coming into effect, is we don't really know what the user's doing. Like, not with bad, but we don't really know. So utilizing the um the reveal platform to truly get a baseline in terms of how users are acting on a daily basis, then we can focus in specific areas and slowly start to improve the maturity model of the organization when it comes down to um, the DLP policies or the compliance policies or the regulatory policies or even better yet the security and awareness training as well so actually invoking real-time alerts as Stephen alluded to earlier is where a, a core um, component of the AV reveal platform it's not about blocking it's about enabling uh, I think too many times a lot of vendors have come in from a uh, carrot and a stick uh, we want to be the carrot we want to give them the opportunity to make better decisions rather than just ultimately lock stuff down um, and that's where the end goal will, will become Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next question uh, we've got, and this is a good one because there always is a fine line. Where is the fine line between privacy and security? Do you want me to take that, Stephen, or? Yeah, I'll give that one to you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, I've, I, I come from a background of security when it comes to data. Um, there, there is a very much fine line. We've seen so many regulations come into effect over the last 10 years. Um, in certain cases, they've just been revamped, right? So um, privacy of a user, privacy of customer, um, we need to make sure that we're not um, um, inhibiting that. Is, is is probably the best way to probably put that towards. So there is a fine line between privacy and security. So if a user, we all, we'll incorporate a BYOD model, or, or some people do, we all work a remote um, work from home model now, of course. Um, but do we still allow users to utilize bank um, uh, banking applications on their laptop? For sure. Do we allow them to connect to um, personal emails? For sure. But we can give them the flexibility, we can provide that flexibility around understanding is is a user truly allowed to connect to personal emails and applications on the laptop? If it's a hard no, then that's fine as well. As long as the user knows, that's not a problem. But every day when we sign our, our contract of employment or HR policy and we go through this training, it's it's very clear and concise in the fact that if you use this machine, then there will be certain things monitored and actioned. As long as you are honest about that and you provide that back to um, that feedback back to the user, there is and there is an understanding, then at least they're they're aware. But with that comes in mind the fact that if if a user, like I said earlier, a user isn't always doing things wrong, they're just wanting to get on with their work and they might need to send a personal email once upon a time off their personal laptops, and that's fine as well. And um, as long as we can have the ability not to necessarily look into um, their own personal information and we've got visibility of what that might look like, then that's absolutely fine. And with the A-Reveal platform, we can definitely differentiate between corporate B2B information rather than um, consumer to consumer or consumer um, out, um, external as well. So there is a fine line and there is flexibility around it. Um, we just need to be careful in terms of how we approach that. Uh, but very much with the sanctions and regulations, um, privacy is, is a hot topic, uh, but we just don't want to invoke that more so on the fact that everything that we do in the back end, even the operators that we have in terms of the admin console that Stephen showed before, uh, we even incorporate role based access in, into there. So we have all got different DPOs within with internal of the organization, but not everybody needs super admin access. So we can split that and break that down across as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Another question that kind of leads into that and to what you were just saying, actually, that's 
um, come in. So we've seen part of the demo there from Stephen, of course, as to we have certain visibility via tools like this. But the uh, question is, I work on sensitive documents that are not to be read by other people in the office. How do I know if the IT team will be prevented from reading these documents? Um, I'll take this in twofold, right? So it's whether it's a digital or a physical document, um, at the first answer it from a digital perspective. Um, because of the what we can do in terms of the system, we can incorporate um, uh, access governance when it comes to data. So if there's specific um, labels, tags, et cetera, or specific areas of the business which users shouldn't be accessing, then, then, then yes, we'll have visibility of that in, in the digital world. Uh, but when it comes to a physical world, and there's always a fine line from from a data protection perspective in terms of how we address this. I know um, I've got a few friends in 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 legal firms. In fact, we've just um, we've just brought on a new customer here in the UK for a big law firm, and and they have the same requirement. Um, and it's all about do we really need to annotate on a physical asset in comparison to a digital asset? And and I know that some legal firms and law firms like to have these these physical wads of paper which they can annotate and go through their legal contracts and pick out holes as. Uh, in terms of the, the contracts that are in place, um, and, and that's fine as well. Um, but however, it's just making users conscious that what is classified, having a classification schema when it comes to that and what is sensitive to the business is, is circumspect to how they're treating said document. It could be a shopping list, as Stephen alluded to earlier, um, or it could be a severely sensitive legal document in a physical component. Again, education, security, education, awareness is a core component of that. In the digital world, relatively easy. Um, in the physical world, um, it's still easy. We just need to give the, the user the right understanding of what that document and what that data looks like. Right. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and that concludes the questions for today. Awesome. I might jump in here. Um, so just as a, as a bit of a wrap up, we are at the moment running a 14 day inside of vulnerability assessment. Um, that does include that, that wonderful Ava agent. Effectively, we, we install it, we, we run it on your network in that, that, that monitoring phase only. And at the end of it, um, our analysts and also some of the Ava analysts will put together a insightful um, vulnerability check and report on there, which should hopefully then cover quite a few of the different areas that we discussed today. If you did want to have more information about it, or you did want to actually apply and have a look at this as well, please let us know after this and we'll get back out to you. Also, like I mentioned before, and for the obviously for the demonstration purposes as well, if you would like a demonstration of the platform, hopefully with an internet connection that works, um, we can organize that as well. So please do not hesitate to, to reach out and we will be sending out a recording of this um, as well over the next 24 to 48 hours as well. So if you've missed anything, you can go back and see how much lag I had in my demonstration. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Well, on behalf of the team at Ava and Community Cloud, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. As Stephen mentioned, thank you for your patience with some of our connection issues. Thank you, Andy and Sharon from Hillier's Road and the wonderful virtual tasting. And in the coming days, we will share a recording of the webinar and details on how to contact the team at CommuniCloud. So have a lovely evening, everyone, and thank you again. Thank you. Cool. Take care.